Extract 1. Questions 1 to 12. For questions 1 to 12, complete the notes with a word or a short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. step onto the computer uh, later on. Okay. So just in your own words, tell me what's brought you in today. Um, well, I've been getting some diarrhea really, mm -hmm. yeah, for the last sort of, well, two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so before two or three weeks, no problems really? Um, so before that, uh, no, no, I mean, I, no, I've just been going normally, which is once every couple of days or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no problems normally. Okay. So just tell me a little bit more about the diarrhea, what it's like and things like that. Um, so like what, what, what my poo looks mm. like sort of thing. Mm. Okay. Um, so that's, it's quite, run, it's runnier, yeah. sort of looser yeah. than normal. I don't think there's any change in like colour or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, and I probably, um, but, uh, but I'm just going a lot more often. Yeah. Can I just check, do you have any blood in it at all? Oh, um, gosh, yes, I, I'm surprised I haven't said that already. Mm -hmm. It's worrying me. Um, yeah, th that I've had um, for a couple of a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And is it difficult to flush away at all? No, oh, no, no, it's not difficult mm -hmm. to flush away. Yeah, and do you ever see any food that's not digested properly in it? N not, no, that wouldn't be something, no. Mm -hmm. okay. So you said diarrhea, but how many times a day does it actually happen? Um, well, I would say somewhere between... Well, at the moment, probably somewhere like yesterday, it was probably about eight times. Eight times, yeah, oh dear. Yeah. I mean, I don't don't think it's been like that every day for the yeah, last three sure. weeks, but but up to eight times up a to day. Eight times, yeah. yeah. Do you have to get up at night to go to the yes, toilet? Yes, yeah. Oh dear. yeah, yeah. And I've never had to do that before. And you're losing sleep over it. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm, mm. Mm -hmm. And do you have any tummy pain at all? Yes, um, yeah. That's it's quite sort of crampy, um, mm -hmm. mainly just before I, I go to the toilet, but it can be at other yeah. times. But then does that pain go away once you've been to the toilet? Um, yeah, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. A, a, a little bit. Mm -hmm. And does anything make the pain worse at all? Um, I, just eating. I don't, not that I can mm -hmm. really think of. And you pointed to your tummy. Mm. Exactly where is it? It is, it is just sort of around the middle, yeah. really. Yeah. And how do you describe that pain? Um, I it's sort of, sort, of, sort of crampy. Crampy I guess. is what yeah, you said, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And, and how bad is it? Um, well, no, if ten was excruciating and mm. one was very little pain, then where would you put it? It's not. It's not yeah, I've had worse. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So uh, probably about four. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not agonising, no, but, but it no. certainly is there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, and, it, and you've told me about when it comes on mm -hmm. and what makes it a little bit better and worse as well, yeah. which is good. So I'm just going to ask the rest of the questions just about the, the whole gut itself. Mm -hmm. Do you have any difficulty chewing your food at all? Oh, no, no. No, no mouth ulcers or anything like that? Um, no. Any no. difficulty swallowing your food no. at all? Do you ever get indigestion? No. Not really? Uh, well, sometimes, maybe on a, maybe on a weekend okay. sometimes. Okay, but, but not usually. No, not okay. usually. So this was only about three weeks ago that, that you've had yeah, the problem? Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and prior to that, uh, what, what was your bowel habit like? I don't go that often, really. It's sort mm -hmm. of maybe once a day, once every two days. Once a day, once every two days, yeah. but certainly no diarrhoea. Oh, no. A, a, a normal form stool. No, it's quite harder, yeah. Yeah, yeah. anything. But no blood, not no. black at all? No. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for that. On to your past medical history. Any operations in the past at all? Um, yeah, I did when I was, I was sort of in my teens, probably, I think I was about 15. Um, I had... Um, um, my appendix removed. In your teens, okay, yeah, but yeah. nothing since then? No, no um, new no. operations since then? No. Okay. Uh, you said that you take a little bit of paracetamol for, for your headaches. Yes, yeah. Okay. And uh, are you doing any of the medicines at all? Um, just, well, I've, uh, the pill, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, no, nothing, nothing else. N nothing else at all, okay. Uh, and nothing else over the counter? No, just the paracetamol yeah. for my headache. Uh, any recreational drugs at all? No. Okay, okay. And uh, are you allergic to anything? Oh, um, yes. Um, I'm allergic to um, 
amoxicillin. So mm -hmm. is that penicillin? Yeah. So we're allergic to penicillin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, what happens when you have penicillin? Oh, um, that's what I get. That's when you know talk about a rash again. Yeah. Rash, oh, I see. So that's the rash. Well, no, I'm, but um, yeah. That's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the rash with penicillin. Mm. So who's with you at home? Um. Yeah. So I live with my partner Sam. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. No particular problems there at all. No. 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 Okay. Get about three years. Uh, is there any family history of note? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of, anyway. No, no gut conditions in the family? My aunt, my aunt maybe, um, my aunt had something to do with her tummy, but I don't know what it was, really. Okay. Um, okay. It wasn't cancer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just moving towards the end, I just wanted to explore your ideas, concerns and expectations, really. So what do you think is going on with this problem? Well, I, I, th I think it could be um, an infection. Mm-hmm, mm hmm, mm -hmm. An infection, yeah. Mm. And you told me about one of your concerns about passing it on to people yeah, at work, and especially yeah, the children, yeah, I guess. Yeah. But um, any other concerns? Well, they pass at all? on to me. Yes. Um, my sister, my um, friend's sister, mm -hmm. has got bowel cancer. She's only thirty. Oh dear. Uh, and so it's just the bleeding, really, yes, more than anything, yeah. that's worried me. Um, so mm -hmm. I wondered about that, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm glad I mean, you told I'm, me that. We'll we'll try and reassure you and. Let's see what, what, what turns out in your yeah. case. What do you think we need to do today to help you? Well, I wondered if I might need some tests. I mean, I'm really hoping, because I did have a little look on the internet, and I'm really hoping it's not going to be one of you know, the cameras. I think mm -hmm. it's col colonoscopy or something yeah. like that. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm hoping I don't have to have that. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay um, I think I've got um, everything there. Is there anything else that you want to tell me? Actually, I've just remembered. I, I forgot to ask you about travel. Uh, have you had any travel in the last few months or weeks even? No, 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 no I haven't been away anywhere. Okay, no. and you can't distinctly say that um, this is due to a particular food that you've had or no. and nobody else has had this problem no. in your family? No, no. Just wanted to check that. Yeah. Okay, so is there anything else that you want to tell me about this problem? Um, no, I, I, do, oh, I did, did go travelling about three years ago to Africa. All oh, right, three years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. To, um, to, I went to South Africa and, South Africa. and um, ended up into Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. But were you well there, though? Yeah, I was yeah. well, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. And do you have any questions for me? Um, no. How likely is it that I'm going to have a camera? Well, I think initially we'll probably run some blood tests okay. and do the stool sample right. uh, and make sure there's no infection. Then I probably need to get uh, a gut specialist to have a look at you uh, okay. if it hasn't got better in a matter of weeks. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or a short phrase. You may have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Come in. Hi, Ms. Jones. Yes. I'm Jane Crone. I'm a medical student with the university nice here. Nice to meet you. I've been sent in by Dr. Smith as part of our training as a medical student to do an interview with you. Okay. And then I'll take that information back to Dr. Smith, and then she will come back in and see you then after that. Okay. All right. How may I address you? Um, Mrs. Jones is fine. All right. Thank you. Um, is that okay with you today to talk? Yes, that would okay. be fine. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start out today by just talking a little bit with you about your chief complaint. What brings you here today? Sure. Um, my left elbow has actually been bugging me a lot. Um, every once in a while I've been getting a little bit of pain, um, extending my arm and going back to bending it. Um, really that's the primary reason I've come in. I've attempted to take a little bit of Tylenol to relieve the pain, but it's not really seeming to help much. Okay. Before we talk um, a little bit more about that, is there anything else that you want to talk with either me or Dr. Smith today? Um, not that I can think of, no. Okay. Tell me more about this pain. Um, it's just kind of a throbbing pain. It'll act up kind of randomly throughout the day. Um, it doesn't, it's not specific to, you know, the morning or evening. 
or even in the middle of the day or night. Um, it just kind of randomly acts up. Uh, I would say excessively, like when I'm doing work, like after the dishes, um, it'll start to act up. If I, you know, lift one of my children up, it'll start to act up. So okay. any sort of exertion is kind of where I've noticed a lot of the pain coming from. And tell me, when did it start for you? Um, I would say in the area about maybe a week and a half to two weeks ago. Okay. And you described the pain as throbbing. Is there mm -hmm. anything else about the pain in terms of the quality of the pain that you want to describe for me? Um, no, just really throbbing. Okay, it started about a week to two weeks ago. Okay, and do you recall what you were doing at the time that it started? Um, I've been helping my husband clean out the garage lately, and we were lifting some boxes. Um, and that's kind of, I didn't notice it at the moment, but later in the evening, it started to act up. Okay. Um, in, I would like to hear about the, a little bit about the severity of it on a pain scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain mm -hmm. you've ever had, 1 or 0 being no pain. At this, where, how bad is this pain? Um, I would measure it probably about a 6 or 7. 6 or 7? Um, it's become more of a nuisance than an actual physical pain. Okay. And is it a 6 or 7 all the time? Um, whenever it starts to act up, yes. Okay. And how often a day does that happen? I would say maybe two to three times per day. Do you notice any pattern to that at all? No. Okay. Alrighty. And can you point exactly to where it is for me, the location um, of it exactly? It's kind of the area that just kind of wraps around the actual elbow okay. that is really bothering me. And does that pain go up your arm or down your arm or anywhere else on your arm? No, it stays straight in that area. Okay. Um, is there anything else that goes on at the same time? Any other mm -hmm. symptoms that happen? Anything else other than when the pain is happening there? Anything else going on for you? Not that I've noticed, no. Okay. Alrighty. Um, is there anything that makes it feel better? Um, nothing that completely g gets rid of it. Tylenol will relieve it for a temporary period of time, um, but it hasn't gotten rid of it. Okay. And how much Tylenol do you take? Um, I, whatever it says on the bottle, usually one to two tablets. And is that regular strength or extra strength? Regular strength. Okay. And you just take it across the counter, the normal directions Correct. on the bottle? Okay. Mm -hmm. And does anything make it worse? Um, like I mentioned, any sort of exertion, um, picking up a child, doing the dishes, um, pretty much daily kind of living activities. So using it? Yes. Okay. All right. Have you seen anybody else for this complaint? Um, no. Have you, what else have you tried other than the Tylenol and anything else other than the Tylenol? Um, I've attempted to use a heating pad on it, and I've also attempted ice. Uh, neither were successful. Okay. Um, it sounds you've talked a little bit about how it's impacted, you know, you to be able to work in the garage or do the dishes or lift your child. Is mm -hmm. there other impact on your life? Um, like I mentioned, it's just more of a nuisance. Um, there will be times in the middle of the night that it'll start to act up. If I get up to go to the bathroom, I'll notice pain in my elbow. Does it wake you at night? Uh, it doesn't, but if I wake up in the middle of the night, it will um, trouble me in falling back asleep. Okay. What do you think it is? Um, I'm not quite sure. My best guess is maybe some sort of pulled muscle or something. Okay. Um, but honestly, I don't know. All right. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the text, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you will hear people talking in different healthcare settings. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now, look at question 25. Now, read the question. Joe, have a seat. Uh, finally. It sounds like you're feeling a bit frustrated. 
Dr. Miller, I've been waiting for over two hours. Mm hmm. Look, when I called this morning, I explained to your receptionist that I needed this refill right away. Mm -hmm. She said you didn't do refills over the phone. I said, fine. But I explained about my busy day, and could she give me any idea as to whether you were running behind? She said she had no idea. She was completely unhelpful and rude. So it sounds like you didn't get the straight answer you were looking for. No, I didn't. All I wanted was a little information as to when and how long you were going to be. So I could make a decision. Should I stay or should I go? As it is, my son had to catch a cab home from his basketball game because I wasn't there to meet him. Question 26. Now, read the question. Hello, Mrs. Flores. Hello, doctor. How are you? So, I've scheduled this meeting for us today to discuss the results of your breast biopsy, but I've actually given my pager and my cell phone, num cell phone to my nurse practitioner so that we don't get interrupted. Okay. Um, are you alone or did you come with someone? No, my children had to work today, so I'm by myself. Okay. So, how are you doing? Uh, I still get tired and I get dizzy if I get too tired. I've got some knee problems and uh, yesterday I had some nausea. Uh, better today. Uh, I think it's probably mostly because of the uh, blood count, the anemia. Okay. So I think I'm okay. How about any anxiety or depression? Well, I'm really worried about the test. I, uh, I have a lump, so I'm afraid. I, uh, I, don't under, I don't know about that test they did with the needle. Have these symptoms affected your life in general, your ability to complete your housework? Well, I've cut back my uh, volunteering at the nursing home, but I still babysit my grandchildren. Okay. So Question 27. Now, read the question. Okay, Mr. Fernandez, my shift's coming to an end and I'll be leaving soon. The oncoming nurse and I will be coming in to give bedside report. We encourage you and your wife to be involved in the, in the plan of care for the day. We only have a short amount of time to give report, so is there anything you need before I leave? I could take care of it right now. Do you, how's your pain or do you need to be repositioned? My pain is doing well. I'm using this button right here. Okay. And uh, do you need to be repositioned? And no, but I would like another pillow behind okay. my head. Great. Sure. Do you need to use the restroom? Uh, no, thanks. I have been assisted already by the other nurse. Okay. The oncoming nurse and I will be back in a few minutes, minutes and we uh, encourage both of you to be involved in the plan of care as much as possible today. Okay, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Mr. Fernandez, this is Anna. She'll be taking over your care now. Hello. Good morning. Anna, this is Mr. Fernandez and his wife, Judy. Hi, nice, nice to meet both of you. Here. I'm going to put my name on the board so you guys can remember it, okay? Yes. Right. Mr. Fernandez is a 52-year-old gentleman who was admitted to the ER last night. He lives with his wife, Judy, and was found down at home. They also know that he had lower extremity swelling for five days and was experiencing some shortness of breath and weakness. Yes, he did fall down in the bathroom last evening. I don't believe he lost consciousness. When they arrived to the emergency room, he was found to be in atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular rate between the 150s and 160s. After two boluses of diltiazem, he was started on a drip. Uh, he has two peripheral IVs, an 18 gauge in his left hand and an 18 gauge in his left hand. Can I take a look at your IVs? Both were started in the emergency room. Okay. Okay. His previous medical history includes hypertension and an MI two years ago, as well as CHF. 
These are all written on the card decks, so you can take a look at these a little bit better. He's allergic to penicillin, which causes a rash. Question 28. Now, read the question. Hey, Narissa, let's hear about this patient that you've been seeing. So we have Jonathan, who is a 24-year-old male, African-American male, who presented to the ED last night with bilateral pain in both knees. He has a history of sickle cell disease. Um, he said that the pain started two days ago while he was working the night shift and has gradually gotten worse. Um, the pain is an 8 out of 10 and has not been relieved with his Percocet. It is also worse upon standing and walking. Um, he reports chills, uh, mild shortness of breath, but he does deny having a fever, um, any chest pain, nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pain. Um, his past medical history does include um, a history of stuttering priapism and lower extremity ulcers. Uh, he also had his last pain crisis about a year ago. Um, he also lives with his mom and four siblings, two of which also have sickle cell disease. Um, he doesn't smoke, he doesn't do any drugs, but he does drink alcohol socially, and the last time was last weekend. Um, his review of systems was unremarkable, except for some intermittent left hand pain. Uh, his vitals were also normal, except for an elevated heart rate, and his O2 sats were actually pretty low at 89%. What was the heart rate elevated at? At 98. Okay. Yes, sir. Question 29. Now, read the question. Uh, Jonathan, uh, this is uh, Dr. Jones and our internal medicine service team. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be presenting your case uh, to them. Is that all right if I do that in the presence of your girlfriend and uh, co-worker here? Yes, that's fine. Right. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so this is uh, the first UMC visit for Jonathan, who is a 24-year-old African-American um, with a history of sickle cell disease who presented with, to the emergency department uh, with a two-day history of bilateral knee pain. He's ectomorphic and is in moderate distress. Uh, the pain began Tuesday at approximately 4 a.m. Uh, while he was working a night shift at Walmart. He had uh, difficulty sleeping because of the pain uh, that night, and the pain gradually continued to increase due uh, to, se to a severity of 8 out of 10 today. The pain was exacerbated with walking and standing um, and was not significantly relieved with Percocet, um, which he received from another physician that we... Um, Question 30. Now, read the question. As part of implementing the Releasing Time to Care module of the Productive Ward series, the Shift Handover module was introduced in the Midlands Regional Hospital Tullamore. This module focuses on developing practical and structured methods of improving ward handover. To support the implementation process, the module team developed this training video, which aims to educate nursing and healthcare assistant staff on how to conduct a clear, comprehensive, person-centered handover within a timely manner using a standardized, structured format. The video shows how this approach to shift handover improves patient outcomes through enhancing patient safety, improving the delivery of care, reducing adverse incidents, reducing the time spent in handover, improving the quality of handover information. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the text, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. 
For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B, or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Complete the answers as you listen. Now, look at extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36. Sometimes you can have something wrong with your health and not know it. You might have a diffuse range of kind of odd things going on for you physically that you've noticed, but they maybe don't seem related or don't seem to add up to anything. 70% of women who have polycystic ovarian syndrome don't know they have it. And it's polycystic ovarian syndrome, or PCOS, that we're going to spend a bit of time talking about now. Dr. Sonia Davison is an endocrinologist from the Jean Hales Foundation. Hello, Sonia. Hello. Uh, what is polycystic ovarian syndrome and, and why is having it, whether you know it or not, a problem? Uh, it's a very, uh, very common hormonal problem in reproductive age women, but can extend after that time. It's essentially a very strangely named syndrome, but it's a hormonal problem where women tend to not ovulate or produce eggs very regularly, and therefore periods can be irregular or absent or very erratic. It also is associated usually with excess male-type hormones, which we normally make, but they have consequences such as excess facial or body hair growth, acne or oily skin, and in some women, scalp hair loss. Um, and it's the not other an attractive collection it, of it, things, it, and it? it's a rotten thing because this is usually something that comes about in twenties or teenage years, and women do not want to be hairy. And and the, there is another part of this; they tend to be overweight. But having said that, there's a broad spectrum. Some are very thin and have acne. Some are overweight, have a lot of excess hair growth and never have periods. And fertility is a big part of this as well for yeah. those who want to achieve pregnancy. So what causes it? We don't know. No. Um, if I knew that, I'd be a very famous One of lady. Those I think. idiopathic. <laughs> Mm. With, there are genetic links, definitely. Yeah. Uh, often I'll see the, the girl sitting with me with her mum and you can see that mum has it as well. There are racial um, uh, uh, links as well, so Indigenous women, uh, Asian women as well, uh, African-American women. So there are links there, but we just don't know of a, a particular cause. So do we know how common it is? I mean, if, if, as I mentioned, lots of women have it are undiagnosed, what do you know about its prevalence? Uh, well... Just, just to make things even e uh, more difficult, there are three sets of criteria to diagnose this condition and various people around the world look at different criteria. Uh, but effectively, there was one a, a study of in Australian women of about 750 women. One set of criteria said it was 8%. Another said about 18% and another set of criteria said about 12%. So I think we can say up to 18%, which is a lot mm. of women. Mm. And we are getting bigger as a society, 
uh, because we're not moving as much, etc. And women, when they put on weight, can have this syndrome sort of manifest. Well, recently, I think the guidelines in Australia for diagnosing um, polycystic ovarian syndrome have been updated. Is that right? It's not more about the diagnosis. It's more about the management. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there are various things that we do uh, in recognising this syndrome, in saying what is normal, and and guidance for GPs as to what's good for treatment, for fertility, and for other things. Uh, So it's more about general guidance. This is not an easily diagnosed syndrome. Well, I was going to say, is it is it actually with that that sort of set of possibilities? Is it easy to miss? Women will know there's something wrong, but they they will go to GPs, and GPs will still get it wrong. And even the ultrasound finding of polycystic ovaries, up to a third of normal women can have that. So I have women come with the ultrasound, oh, I've got polycystic ovaries. Well, you might do, but you don't have the syndrome. And I've got other women who have the syndrome, clearly, but their ovaries are normal. So it's a really poorly... So how do you get a definitive diagnosis? By having two out of three of those criteria, (coughs) excuse me, that we mentioned before. So it doesn't matter what set of criteria you use, it's two out of three, or some of the criteria have you you have to have two of the the sets of the excess hormones, uh, the male type hormones, the acne or excess hair and the problems with ovulation are the mainstay of this. The polycystic ovaries on an ultrasound doesn't really matter. Right. Now, um, uh, Sonia, as I understand it, uh, something that's sort of underlying in this syndrome, uh, I think, is insulin resistance. We, We think this underpins the whole syndrome. So that's effectively really, it's hard to explain, but having too much insulin that doesn't work very effectively and that insulin changes the ovaries from a normal functioning ovary into an ovary that doesn't tend to make eggs regularly and also makes increased um, male-type hormones, which bring about the symptoms which will bring a lady to sit in my office Mm. and have a problem. Well, let's hear a voice memo now from someone who's had polycystic ovarian syndrome for a few years now. Hi, my name's Samantha and I was diagnosed with PCOS when I was 21. Signs and symptoms that I had when I was growing up was amenorrhea, so irregular menstrual cycles, a lot of abdominal cramping and a lot of fatigue. I was quite tired all the time and I still get a lot of abdominal cramps. I was diagnosed by my gynecologist where I had to have several ultrasounds done and blood tests to check hormone levels. Managing my PCOS these days is quite difficult. A lot of PCOS sufferers are given insulin based medication to help manage their uh, weight but unfortunately this actually makes me quite sick so I'm left to look at uh, my exercise and my diet to see if I can change things that way and try and lose a bit of weight which is unfortunately quite difficult. Well, many thanks, Samantha, for providing that voice memo to us. Dr. Sonia Davison, um, that link to insulin resistance, what other health impacts does, um, does that mean polycystic ovarian syndrome brings? So usually if they do have weight excess, uh, they are therefore at risk for impaired glucose tolerance or step towards type 2 diabetes. Uh, they, it doesn't mean they're all going to get it, but, but they definitely are at risk, especially when there is that excess weight. And, and as Samantha said, do you, do you know what? Lifestyle is an extremely important part of management of polycystic ovary syndrome and even a 5 to 10% weight. And if that's 100 kilos, because some of these girls are 100 kilos and struggle with weight, that, that's about a, a, a 5 to 10 kilo weight loss, which you can do with real concerted effort, that will turn the hormones around for some women and and reduce their problems and also reduce their risk of insulin problems and type 2 diabetes and probably heart disease also down the track. Now look at extract 2. Extract 2. Questions 37 to 42. 
You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. When you think of how you want your life to be in old age, should you live so long, so things like getting the care you need and being treated with dignity and kindness, well, that's a fair way from how aged care is working in this country at the moment. Last night, ABC TV broadcast part one of a huge crowdsourced investigation where 4,000 people responded to Four Corners' invitation to share their experiences of aged care. Many of the people who responded work in the industry. Here in Life Matters, let's continue to talk about all this together. Now, someone with personal experiences of the difficulties and distress of trying to get good and appropriate aged care is Linda Saltarelli. Linda's the founder of a group called Aged Care Crisis. Linda, hello. Welcome to Life Matters. Thank you. Now, what prompted you to start this group, Aged Care Crisis? Well, around 15 years ago, my father suffered a debilitating stroke and was hospitalised as a result. And um, we were told that Dad should be moved to a nursing home. And it was then I realised how vulnerable he was and we just found it impossible to find a nursing home that could cater to his high care needs. And it was then that that's when I got involved with, um, uh, I set up Aged Care Crisis. And look... Um, was up, it a crisis for your family? It, it, we felt it was at the time and that's why I named the group Aged Care Crisis and I think we saw how that played out last night and look I really um, I would like to acknowledge and thank the countless whistleblowers both aged care staff and and uh, family members as well as all of the hard work that independent volunteer community based groups like that yours are, yeah like us and there's there's several others um, you know that have worked so hard to shine a much needed light on what is happening in aged care well what linda what are the main complaints that people come to you with saying the the bulk of the complaints that, that we receive are generally around staffing um, issues. Um, Australia has woefully inadequate numbers of trained staff by international standards and because we've been doing this for so long we have um, looked um, overseas and um, for example in the USA each resident gets double the amount of care from trained nurses and one hour um, and a third more nursing care each day. It's just it's just impossible to provide good care with that level of care. I mean, the, currently the benchmarks our nursing home uses uh, in determining staffing requirements are based on commercial considerations and not research. I mean, the, these are developed by financial companies that support the providers and lobbies government on their behalf. Uh, they are set at levels that make this very poor staffing look legitimate. Mm. I mean, 
Sorry, um, one of the most significant factors in providing quality residential aged care is to ensure that there are sufficiently skilled staff on hand to provide that care. I mean, staff frequently tell us they're unable to care for residents properly, you know, given the the conditions and time constraints. Yes, well, we saw that in That's Four right. Corners last night. I mean, one thing that I guess really struck me, Linda, was uh, one of the personal care assistants, I think, talked about having an average of six minutes with each resident each morning to get them up, get them toileted, get them showered, get them dressed and ready for breakfast. Now, I can't even do that myself in six minutes, let alone uh, get a frail elderly person ready for, for the day in that time. Yes, well, in our view, um, and, and when I watched that, that part of the program, um, the, the problems revealed a more symptomatic of a wider structural problem in aged care that really must be addressed. I mean, decisions are being made not only without data about care, but by people who have no knowledge of the significance of this. Uh, owners and senior management seem to be largely drawn from the business, finance and managerial sectors who have no clinical care experience. I mean, the concerns are that bodies that report on staffing benchmarks to um, government, I industry are using this and, and that is the level of clinical knowledge and engagement on which they are based. Uh, politicians are advised by them. They're accepted as authorities or subject matter experts. They are selected from industry and appointed appointed by government uh, and not by those in the sector who actually provide the care. Um, without experience or data and a willingness to listen to contrary messages coming up from the coalface, managers and politicians are effectively shielded from the consequences of their actions. Uh, you know, we should not really be surprised at what's happened. Well, if you have experiences of this kind with aged care, do get in touch. Do please email us, lifematters at abc.net.au. Michael McKenzie is here with me, Amanda Smith, uh, along with Linda Saltarelli. Michael. Thanks for that, Amanda. And look, if you're calling through at the moment, we really want to get to your calls as quickly as possible. So as much as we do want to hear your stories, and every story has merit, we do ask you, if you can, to try and keep the story fairly to the point, because we have so many people coming through at the moment on our, on our phones here at Life Matters. Felicity, I might go to you in Sydney. Now, Felicity, your mother uh, had a reasonably good experience in a retirement village. Tell us about that. Well, it was very difficult for me to let go of my mum that she had dementia and she wasn't safe at home. And very shortly after she was admitted to a very large um, Anglican retirement village here in Sydney, uh, she lost her language. So she could no longer communicate directly with me. However... I work, so I would visit her outside visiting hours, and I saw the nursing home when people didn't expect to see the, uh, visitors there. Right, mm. interesting. And it was, very, it was very enlightening for me because what I noticed at her particular village was that the staff number was there for eight years, which is way, way above average. Um, they, they had the same staff. The, 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 a core nucleus of staff was there that whole time. Which goes to the core that perhaps this is a quality workplace. It, it is, yes. So, and Felicity, yes. you said your mother was in, in high care for eight years? She was there for eight years. Yeah, yes. my mother was similarly with dementia in high care for ten years. They, they're, the, they're the long, long stars. It's unusual, isn't it? Very unusual. And but it you get to see a lot. You do, you do. And I noticed it was also a facility that did not have a policy of um, medicating patients. So there were two occasions when I actually wrote a letter because I noticed people were very distressed and I felt that they needed some medication. And you know what? They were responded to straight away. They weren't my family members, but they were so responsive, really. Well, Very responsive. well, hats off to that, that particular retirement village there. Yeah, it's good to hear yeah, a, no, a, a it, good story. Br brilliant place. And let me tell you, the matron, she got very ill. She uh, passed away from melanoma. When she was diagnosed, she said she would like to be nursed there. And so the matron stayed there herself. That's a, that's a good sign, isn't it? Thank you, uh, Felicity. Let's That is the end of part C.
You now have two minutes to check your answers. That is the end of this listening test. Thank you very much for practicing this test with Lifestyle Training Center. You can now check in the description and verify your answers. If you find this video helpful, please subscribe to our channel and write down your comments and let us know how you feel about it. If you need more help or for training, please feel free to contact us. Details can be found in the description. Until we see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.